Good evening. <laughs> My name is Lewis Blackman. Welcome to this very special screening honoring somebody we all loved a lot, L.M. Kit Carson. And when you meet Kit's... You know, <laughs> and when you meet Kit's um, friends or the people he mentored or the people he inspired or the people who just knew him, they'll quickly try and give you all these credits about all the things he did. Um, and he did an extraordinary array of things, but the reality is the people who knew him, who loved him, what they're trying to, they're trying to tell you how important he was. And there's no way to do it, and it's not the films he made, it's not the people he mentored, it's not what he wrote, it's not, it was how he influenced and inspired people, it was how again and again and again he went out of his way to mentor people, it was how we're, there were no doors, I mean there were just walls, he built doors and opened the doors and took everybody through them with him. And so the reality of why Kid is great is, is not Paris, Texas, or Te Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, or Bottle Rocket. You know, it's not the Dallas Film Fest solo, I mean the USA Film Fest solo, how he inspired South by Southwest early on. It's this force of nature, this creative, uh, loving, giving, caring talent, somebody who just lived and breathed and ate, ate cinema. And it was just, it, it, it's so exciting to be around. And so we give the credits because we're trying to somehow get close to, to telling you who this man was, who this incredible person was. To, to start off this thing, this very, in, to me, important and meaningful celebration, there's really nobody better else than his partner in crime and, and so many great um, films and adventures. Somebody else who worked with a lot of us and influenced one of the producers on Direction Man and uh, his, 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 his mate, his, his partner, Cynthia Harcraft. was not his name, and he did not live at 402 Brown Street. We tried. We tried, we tried, we tried to find him. He was not there. He was never there. We don't know. His, so that's all we got. Um, Dave Holtzman's Diary was the first film that Kit made. The interesting thing about it is that Jim McBride shot it, and then the film was stolen. He shot it with someone else as David Holtzman. And then he didn't really like it, and the film was stolen, and he reshot it with Kit as David Holtzman. And I always thought that was interesting because it's sort of kind of perfect with Kit. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see the other one, but yeah, Jim didn't like it, so I'm going to go with that. Um, they shot it in 10 days. It was improv, Kit slept, because he was intense. Um, and so according to him, he slept in the apartment that they shot in because he wanted the same character. I'm pretty sure that he strapped everything on and didn't take that off the other, either, either, either. I hope you enjoy it. It's weirdly um, sort of per prolific and prophetic in the fact that what we have today is what they were doing then in 1968. I wasn't there, but it's stunning. Enjoy. Uh, so um, we're going we're gonna to just bring everybody up on the stage. And, and folks, when you come to the stage, there's a, there's a walkway that has actual <laughs> handles on it. So... Our lawyers have advised that you walk up that side. So please do walk up that side. And uh, I, I want to go ahead and bring to the stage, uh, obviously, Lewis and Cynthia, whom you met earlier. Come on up. We, we've also got, coming up to the stage, Joe Dishner. We've got Jim Hunt, Natalie Dickinson, and uh, Johnny Mars is here, too. And, oh, and uh, Guillermo del Toro is also here. Look, everybody's here. Come on up, have a seat. After you, after you. And uh, I'm Lars Milson from Austin Film Society. I'm just going to be up here kind of keeping things moving. That was two kinds. No pictures, no pictures. <laughs>
I can finally use the eclair to shoot Woodstock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first GoPro, the first steady cam. The so, other thing about that, um, if we're going to talk about Michael Wadley, is um, the whole Thunderbird lady. Kit was not there for that. Hunter Carson's that, here too. That was. <laughs> That was um, uh, Michael Wadley interviewed the Thunderbird lady, and Michael is actually Harry, and Kit actually was not. Um, but that's where that your very Harry came from. <laughs> I, I want to just kind of go down the line and just kind of everybody sort of introduce yourself and. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about your relationship with uh, LMK Carson. Can we just uh, start? We'll start on this side. Hunter Carson. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Joe Dishner. I uh, met Kit uh, many, many years ago. I worked on um, Love Crimes, Love which, Crimes. which he did a, I don't know, it was like a million dollar reshoot mm -hmm. and have many stories about that. <laughs> Jim Hart, um, I was a student at SMU in 1967 when this little kind of imp on methadrine and speed and acid showed up in our film department <laughs> with this film under his arm called David Holzman's Diary. That G. William Jones, our great uh, professor who started that um, department, brought Kit in. Um, that's how I met Kit Carson, was seeing this film for the first time, and Kit was there. Um, and um, he carved me out of the herd. Uh, he mentored me. He was my first. Uh, he, was my, he was my first mentor. Uh, he's the reason I'm in this business. Um, and all I can say is that uh, somewhere out there, there's somebody that's going to make you feel special and make you feel like you have something unique. Um, that's what Kit did for me. I met Kit when I was 25. I married him when I was 27. He taught me almost everything I know, and I taught him the things he didn't. Um, That's all I got. <laughs> I've never seen this print. I've never seen David Holtzman look that good. <laughs> That's all I have. You know, so good about Kit. Throughout his whole life, he had great hair. <laughs> <laughs> Always. 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 Great hair. Always. Up until the end, he had great hair. I'm sure Pacino and Hoffman and De Niro all studied this film. You know, you sit here and watch Kit do this, and he makes it effortless, and this is what everybody's doing today. Um, Kit had a thing about um, whatever he did was before everyone else understood it. And I didn't know that <laughs> until time went by. And now I know that. And it's an interesting thing to know, and it was an interesting way to be taught or mentored, depending upon what term you want to use. And he was really vain. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely vain. No, Again, good. good hair. <laughs> I'm Natalie Dickinson, and... Okay, that's sad. <laughs> okay, you're gonna look at something sad. <laughs> Well, my relationship with Kit is a little different. I know a lot of you knew him for a long time, but I only knew him for the last couple of years of his life. And like Jim was saying, he was the first person to really take something that I'd done and see something and be like, you've got a voice and you've got something to say. And I just couldn't believe that this person that had done, every time I talk to somebody, I hear something else new that he's done. I don't even know how long this guy's resume is. And, um, and he saw something in me and, Another thing that's unique about our relationship is that about half of it was when he was in the hospital and he became so much more to me than a mentor. And I've never had somebody so close to me go through something like that. And I think 
all of us till the very end, we, I thought he was going to pull it out and just walk into Starbucks one day and be like, I told you I was going to make it through all that. And Anyway, every time I do something new, or we just finish this short film, and I just keep thinking, oh, man, I wish Kit could see this. And, anyway. Yeah, my name's Johnny Mars, and uh, I met Kit when I was in high school. I was a classmate with Hunter, and uh, I was 15. <clears throat> it had no, uh, I, you know, I was an actor at that point, doing a lot of uh, theatrical stuff, school plays, community theater, whatever. And uh, he really pulled me aside and said, uh, you know, you could probably do this for a living if you wanted to. <laughs> and uh, that's awesome. <laughs> and so uh, he kind of spent the next 15 years really just trying to show me how to do that. And uh, everything you're hearing up here is ubiquitous. I mean, a great quote was he kind of carved me from the he, he carved me from the herd. I mean, that's just very true. He just kind of takes you by the hand and uh, opens a door. And you're just in this new place that you didn't know existed. And, uh, you know, if anything, the man is inspiration. And, like, that's really, that's really what, he, what he gave. And it's awesome that we're all here. <laughs> like, I love this. He, he, he deserves this every day. He's awesome. Yeah, this one's for Kit. Um, I actually countered Kit in, in the best way possible. I saw David Holzman's diary when I was a kid in Boston. There was no internet. There were uh, underground publications, but they didn't do extensive film coverage. I was playing at, um, I think, the Brattle, but I'm not sure. And I went to see it, and what, at the end, which you guys all missed because you at least heard of the legend, was when it came up, it became apparent that this was not really a cinema verite film, but was a scripted narrative. The entire audience started moaning. <laughs> and some people even, pro it was like, as though they had just seen Devil's Reign. I thought it was <laughs> they, booed. They, they protested. Kid, kid said it was booed. <laughs> yes. It, but I mean, the whole, you, like, everyone went like, no, yeah. and booed it. You couldn't, I mean, it, you, it, one, instead of Verte barely existed. I mean, Jean Roche was, what, 59, and this is 67. Um, so you didn't, you, you didn't even know what he was parodying, but it was really a shock. And then I got to meet, meet Kit later on, kind of was a little in awe. And then when we started South by Southwest, Kit would show up and, Periodically, he would lean over and he would go, you know, I might do this this way. And it would always be like, you were doing something terribly wrong, and instead of saying, you're doing it terribly wrong, he'd just say, I might do it this way. And you'd lean back, and the next day you'd say, I just had a great idea, everybody. <laughs> and so he was always, in Cynthia too, you know, they were there for us, and in the early days, having Kit show up at your event was a really big deal, and he was there. Hi, I'm Guillermo del Toro, and uh, you know, Kit, uh, I suspect that Kit stole the original David Holman. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, say, that, that, it was the second version. That's my theory, that he stole the first one, and uh, <laughs> he probably, for his own game. No, I think that, in a way, seeing this was, uh, is the best way to honor Kit. I, I, I think that we, we were all there, uh, with him at the end, and, and there is enough uh, pain and, and tears about that, and I think that I, I love seeing this tonight, today, because, um, you know, I saw him so young, and so so much uh, as precious and as alive as as he was, you know, you know how you say you age only on the inside, and uh, on the outside, on the inside you're always 23, you know, and uh, and I think that. Uh, the kid, the kid that I knew every time was that kid. You know, yeah. they are so, they were doppelgangers spiritually in a way, David and him, in many many ways. The way because he built the character from him, he definitely built it from him, and uh, he had this amazing. Uh, he was a, like an actor. He was very much. I, I have many many crazy theories. I think that. Even although he's not the base for the dude on, on Lebowski, he had, he had the Lebowski-esque capacity to be, the, to be everywhere at the most opportune and strange times. You know, and I'm sure some anarchists did pee on his rug at some point. But I met him, I met him around 
92, 93, right after Kronos. I had just done Kronos and I, I read in a, uh, you know, Sundance was coming to Guadalajara to do a lab, the first lab we did there. And uh, I read who the people were that was coming, who, who were they, and I read Kit Carson. And, and I was dying to meet Kit because of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> it was Paris, Texas, yes, but this and that, but I just had so many questions to ask him. And I thought, this, I, this is the guy that worked with Bim Benders, this is the guy that did Paris, Texas. I was expecting to meet this cryptic, super serious, uh, strange dude, and then in, come, in comes Kid, and he has exactly the same tics that you see in David Holzman. See, he perennially was coughing, he was perennially <laughs> clearing his throat. He would go, yes, Guillermo, what? <clears throat> <clears throat> really? What, what time is it? <laughs> you know, so you, would, you didn't know if he was having an idea, lapsing out of an idea, uh, withholding a fart. I had no idea what. <laughs> he, had, he had this incredible delivery for everything. Everything was so important to Kit. The way he talked and the way he listened. Yeah, and he, it, was, it was truly like that. I was saying, kid, I, I had some chicken today. And he said, chicken? <laughs> chicken. So he was, he was very much like an actor. And then he says, when you say chicken, you mean the bird, right? Like this. <laughs> but but he, all, he, he listened like that, he talked like that, and, and you know, the people, when, when people go away, when people pass, uh, you, you identify their absence by the little holes they leave in your life. And, and, and you know, you, you cannot know really uh, how much you need them and how, how much they were there until you find the empty spaces. You know, it's, it's almost like, like coming to your house after a perfect, perfect burglary and just finding that you're missing some essential thing. And I think that that's, uh, that's very much what we feel about Kit. Because, you know, he, he was in so many ways present at the right moments for you. And, uh, and, uh, and <laughs> the wrong moments too. <laughs> and in the wrong way he was. He was, the best thing about Kit was uh, you always wanted him to smile. Because he had the greatest smile. And the, the greatest prize, the, the palm door of interaction with Kid was when he went, aha, <laughs> you know? And his aha was like winning an Oscar. You had made him laugh, you had made him think. And, 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 and he permeated my life little by little, like he used, I can tell you this may not mean anything to you, but some, some of you will recognize it. His favorite punctuation mark was the dash, <laughs> the way he wrote. He would, he would not use commas or, uh, and to this day, I write like that. Uh, Kit, Kit, and uh, Kit, Cynthia, and I went to write a screenplay <laughs> to, New, to the Hamptons uh, in a winter full of fucking ticks. The, the, everything was full of ticks in the house we were writing. So I, I spent ev that whole writing uh, weeks afraid of ticks. It was never normal with Kit. A normal day would be, I would say, Kit, uh, I would wake up at seven. Kid would say, hey, kid, I'm going to make some coffee. Uh, I say, yeah, fine. Like, uh, he says, you know, there's no coffee. We should go get some. OK, I, that's 9, o 9 o'clock in the morning. He would say, should we buy some bread? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we'll write. OK, then we'll write. And he would say, you know, this bread is really good. We should enjoy it, and then we'll write. <laughs> it would be 10.30. He says, is it too early for lunch? Goes, no. You know what? Let's, let's, go, let's go have lunch, and then we'll write. And the weeks elapsed. And I don't know if this was a Zen exercise, but we had to deliver this screenplay for Francis Ford Coppola called Monte Cristo. And even the way we, we came to that screenplay was magical because he came to Sundance and he read what I had and I met him and he was so adorable. You know, you started wanting him to teach you and then you wanted to adopt him. <laughs> you know, and you wanted to take care of him. And, and he had said, you know, why don't you write this with me? Out of the blue. I mean, that's what Kit was. He would take Wes Anderson and a little short and a dinner with them and say, let, let us help you make Wasn't this. It wasn't even a whole short. 
It, it was, was not five a, minutes. But he but to take a guy from Guadalajara that had just done a very strange movie and say, why don't you write this for me with me uh, for Roman Coppola <laughs> and take me to meet Francis and take me to meet Roman and in the middle of the of the process of writing to say he should direct it. <laughs> no, not Roman, who was, the, who was the, the director and the son of the producer, and the producer was Francis fucking Ford Coppola. And he said, and I say, you really think so? He says, yeah, you know it better than Roman. He says, we'll, we'll call him. I go, okay, <laughs> we will. And, and we call him, he says, and Kid says, I think Guillermo should direct this. And Roman goes, I agree. <laughs> And this, I've never met anyone like this in my life. So, you know, I assume this is the way you write screenplays for American studios. <laughs> you take weeks and weeks and then you write them in 72 hours, not fucking sleeping in turns. After we had lunch and dinner and we crushed takes on the floor. And, 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 and you know, that, that was it. Jesus, I, I, donuts. I, and the, and, the, and, and donuts. And donuts. And bagels. And bagels. We, we you know, uh, in when East we were... In it was donuts, in Dallas it was bagels. In Dallas it was bagels, we would go... But in East Hampton it was... It was, it was donuts, donuts yeah. and... Dreesons, uh, right? And the breakfast place. But oh, yeah. in, 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 in Dallas, the entire Carson family survived only on fucking bagels. This is not Huge. True. He would go, he went to a place He's and he bought bagels like, like for the expedition of John Carpenter's The Thing. We bought boxes of bagels, and, and Hunter and I would watch The Simpsons on the, it was just starting, and we were watching The Simpsons on the, on the living room, and bagels, and we never fucking wrote a single word. But that he, he, is, he is truly a guy that is one of the few people I've met that was magical from the beginning to the very end, and, and I'm very, very happy that we're here to say how much we, he, we love him and we miss him. And thank you for being here. Tell us about the Simpsons, Hunter. Oh, okay, okay. We'll hear about the Simpsons. Could you corroborate that story? I can absolutely corroborate that story. And the interesting thing was that it, once you got the bagel in you, then you start to invent like, okay, what do we have? We've got we've got bagels. And, and we've got like oatmeal. And then you're like, okay, how do I make bagel and oatmeal into a meal? <laughs> and so all, the, all everything's true. Um, and, and it's wonderful. And um, thank, oh, thank you, no, thank you. We had food in the house. No, we had food in the house. I, I, we had lots of bagels. We had lots of food in the house. Absolutely. And um, we survived on more than just bagels. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, Lewis, for doing this, and, and, and thank everybody who's here. Thank Austin Film Society. Thank you, guys. Thank you for supporting artists. Thank you for supporting an artist that really believes in supporting artists. You know, what, what I loved about Kit was he could see the possibility in anything. I was working for a commercial place in, in Dallas and ran across Direction Man. And the, uh, yeah. Steve Franco, who was one of the great, he was a great colorist at uh, Video Post, we kept, we looked at it over and over and over. And somehow we ended up going over at uh, you guys' house and we showed it to Kit and Kit did the, <laughs> you know, and he said, uh, yeah. that's a story. And I said, yeah, the guy's crazy. He goes, I'm going to do something with that. And, of course, it was, you know, the, the reaction was, you're out of your fucking mind. <laughs> and he said, no, I think we can do something with that. And he came up with this, and I think it's pretty wonderful. And it was, you know, reality before there was a reality shows and stuff. I mean, it was just, it was just kind of, in, you know, it was one of those things, too, where you look at it, and one of the things that Kid always said was, what makes it work, or it doesn't work, unless he's unless you get the punchline at the end. Right. I've been here for a week. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that was uh, you know one of the one of the great things about Kit was he saw the possibilities in everything. He saw a story in everything. And somewhere there is a better version. Direction man than what but we, we can't find here, it. I we had, that was a. It. But we can't no, find no, no. it. Yeah, no, there was. It, it did look better at one time, yeah, but it yeah. got. Um, it's perfect. It's perfect. And 
and all you know, had to do was But the fact wait, now wait, that wait. It, it was kind of degraded like that makes but it But it all had to do with the spit. <laughs> when Larry Williams, who isn't really Larry Williams, spit, we have a version where it's clear. <laughs> and that was our demarcation line. When we went, oh, that one's clearer. Let's use that one. Library of Congress, you, you need to find it and restore it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. We just still need to find Larry Williams. Kit took so many things seriously, and then it would kind of turn on you. There was a... Uh, I was over, uh, and it was over at you guys' house for something, and somebody from someplace up east had sent him. And I don't, I guess, I don't know if you, I don't know that you were in town. Probably about six of the most beautiful lobsters I've ever seen. Yeah, and he went, and he he had this basket of lobsters, and he went and he talked about how they're hum, they're they're living things. They're this. We can't kill them. Can we go let them go, this, that, and the other? And, of course, I said, let me take them off your hands, you know? And he just went, and I, I mean, he, you know, with all this Jesuit rigmarole, he blessed them, and it was, you know. So, anyway, so I take him home. Them? Well, here's, here's the story. Is he, you know, and and I said, well, well, I think we're going to have for dinner, invite some people over for dinner, whatever. And he goes, well, I just can't, you know. So, of course, about 7 o'clock, the doorbell rings, and he comes in and says, well, I guess we're going to eat the lobsters now. <laughs> and it was like, well, I see, he said, I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't kill him, but I guess I can eat him. <laughs> but he was doing that, he did that kind of stuff all the time. It was these impressions, it's these he was in, he came, I remember in brief in, by why, we came through town, and he says, I want to I want to go eat barbecue, and so we went to this barbecue place, and he ordered soup. <laughs> and I looked at him, and, and I think often I looked at him and said, "You're just out of your mind." And he said, "Well, it's the whole atmosphere. It's the smoke. It's this." And he ate a bowl of lentil soup or something. I I'll, I'll bet you didn't know that there was that he had an idea for David Holtzman's too. <laughs> um, like 12, 12, 14 years ago, the heart thing. When he had yeah. to go, he had to go back and have his heart jump started. Everything was shut down. He was the blood wasn't going to his head. He was even more kit than he was uh, when he was <laughs> kit. <laughs> and uh, Cynthia and I were on the phone. So he was in surgery for twelve hours. Yeah, open heart surgery, yeah, the whole yeah. thing. First call I get from Kit is, Heart! I'm alive! And I've got the idea for David Holzman's Diary Part 2. And he starts telling me the story he had when he was under anesthesia in open heart surgery about David Holzman's Diary Part 2. David Holzman has a heart attack. He goes to the hospital. He has open heart surgery. He sees his whole life, and he finally figures out what the meaning of the film is. <laughs> That's how Kip was. He never quit. He didn't quit while he was in the hospital. The heart, the heart thing was great, too, because he would always go, I died and came back to life. And I, and I would always go, if you died, you'd be dead. <laughs> you didn't come. He goes, no, I really, I think he I died and came back to life. He did come back to life. You know. Yeah, no, and he just he look at you like, that's your problem, not mine. <laughs> you, I'm, the, I'm the one who died. Yeah, yeah, yeah you think I died? Okay, okay, I'm good. You're wrong. So should we take questions? Yeah, we could. We should take we should take great questions. We should take really good questions, questions or on? really, you can know, simplistic questions. We don't, have the we don't have the technology for getting more lights than this. No, we don't we, want more lights them. than this, actually. Who, who's got an incredible question? Right over here, yes. Incredible. The question His is, is favorite this. movie of all time was It's a Wonderful Life. He saw it when he was five. His current, well, what you would think was current was Truffaut. It was the, the French New Wave. Really got him and nailed him. But he was a big fan of, of Hawks, of Cooker, of Stevens. He was a big fan of emotional stories, whether they be comically told 
or sort of dramatically told. And, and, and when we were doing Monte Cristo, you know, we were all talking about the usual uh, Westerns, and for me it was a, re a revelation when we tracked down uh, one ID axe. And, and he yeah. said, we have to watch that because that's the one. Oh, yeah, we had to. That, that's, that's, the, that's the one movie we have to watch. And we lost a couple of days on that. <laughs> <laughs> then it arrived, and then we opened it. And, no, but I, I think that also what is, what, uh, he, could, he could do little things that made it authentic. I mean, I remember this, for a Mexican, is extremely important. Uh, there's a line of dialogue he wrote, and I said, how could he think about that? It's very simple. It's a jailer eating an onion in Mexico. It, it was uh, in Mexico in 1860s. Monte Cristo during the French occupation, and he said, Mexican apples, sweet as onions. And then he proceeded to crush the hand of Monte Cristo. <laughs> and, and, but I, every, day, every now and then, uh, whenever I'm having an onion in Mexico, that fucking line stuck in my head. <laughs> and because it's true, nobody else considers Mexican onions as sweet as apples, but it's absolutely true. And he had, uh, he had moments of clarity with the character. He was. If he was anything, he was a Jesuit, you know. So he was yeah. always pursuing that type type of ethic and truth, and um, he was genuinely preoccupied with the big questions. Uh, it was not a pose. It was not, uh, you know. It was a, a, a true search for him. And I'm a I'm a, a super lapsed Catholic, raised completely on Jesuit school. So, and I think in fact one of our adventures that where we didn't write in Dallas was going to Hunter's school to give a chat uh, <laughs> at Jesuit school. <laughs> he introduced me. I was barely older than the students. And he said, this is a Mexican filmmaker, <laughs> which made the, 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 the chat sound really shitty. <laughs> the, you know, and he said, this is a Mexican filmmaker. He's going to tell you how it is that he makes Mex Mexican films. <laughs> it was not the highest rated Jesuit chat, but that spirit, that spirit of freedom, uh, truth, and uh, ethics that the Jesuit school has was very, very heavy on kids. That was a, a huge influence for him, was, was that type of uh, ethic. And, and it lended itself very well to Westerns. And in, a, in another way, it makes its way into Paris, Texas. You know, it, it had, it had, he had this soulful quest in him. Kid believed that people mattered that stories mattered, but they mattered because people mattered. And that was really his goal. His goal in life was to be part of life and to be part of people and to share and to share and to share <laughs> because if you kind of think of It's a Wonderful Life and you think of that moment when George Bailey's trying to save the savings and loan and everyone wants to take their money out and he stands there and he says, but your money's in his house and, and his money's in his house and his money's in his house. That's what Kit thought and that's how Kit lived his life. Everything was in everyone else's house. And everyone else's house deserved to live. And we had to protect them. And we had to make them live. And tell and their what story. what did we need to do to make know, them live? Yeah. Tell the stories. I, I, I have a Jesuit story for you. <laughs> no one cares, back Joe. To, <laughs> back to this, though. Is this a tone shift? No, yeah, this is a tone shift. Thank you. So when we, uh, yeah, when we did... Uh, Love crimes, and uh, you know, I'd, I'd known Kittle, I'd known you guys a, a while. I was the unit production manager, but anyway, he goes uh, the first day, and it was this kind of massive reshoot for out at the studios of Las Colinas. And uh, anyway, it was like a full crew. We had like I don't know, probably five sets. Anyway, he uh, he he comes up to me and says, "I I, I think before we start, I'm going to have the Monsignor come out." and say a blessing so what's that guy's name the guy has to be a hundred years old that came I out think it, was a but okay. it was somebody anyway so so we so anyway so we uh so i said well you know it, it can't hurt you know i'd like to be 
you know, I'd like to, maybe you can bless the budget too. <laughs> so anyway, so we start and it's, and, and it's, it's the Monsignor and it's the whole crew. And Kit is like this in this very intense thing. So it goes on for maybe three or four minutes. Do you remember this? Yeah. Where we all start looking, people in the crew start looking around like, What's going on? Well, it goes on another 10 minutes, and most of the crew kind of just walks, kind of just backs out. So about 25 minutes into this, and I have no idea what the guy said. Uh, about 25 minutes into it, it's, I think, me and Kit and the Monsignor, and Kit, go, Kit goes, oh, that was great. Now we can shoot now. Where's the crew? <laughs> but anyway, I just thought it was kind of funny because he... He was just so intense about the whole thing. Yeah, the, he, he was the master of dramatic plot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was. Yeah. He was. yeah, I always felt like he didn't necessarily believe in God, but he was terrified of him. <laughs> <laughs> but that was kind of my take on it. I'm pretty sure that's how it goes. Yeah, we got all that out of one question. <laughs> all right, another question Max? like that. There's one in the back. All right, one in the back. Oh, go ahead. Thank you all for all doing this. It's greatly appreciated. Um, so how was this film released? Like what, when it was made, you know, how did they get, I mean, I guess the San Francisco Film Festival existed at the time and you mentioned seeing it in New York. What sort of release did it have and, and how did it get released? It went, it, it won the Mannheim Film Festival and then it was released through college, in the college campus Sort of reality, in fact, the first distributor for it was New Line, before they were actually New Line, as you know them. And they distributed on college campuses, so that was its first release, and it sort of lived in that world for a very long time. Um, Kino Lorber might be its first real official release. Yeah, and, they, and that, that's a print I'd never seen, that, it's beautiful. It's stunning. Um, I've always seen it in a real 16 millimeter uh, format. So they restored it, and I want to say it was maybe 10 years ago that it became acceptable or releasable. You could get a hold of it. Guillermo, when did you get a copy of it on Laserdisc? I think it came out on Criterion. Yeah, when? Yeah. But yeah. it was Laserdisc. Early, yeah, early, early Criterion. But when? Like, oh, fuck me if I remember. Late 90s? <laughs> late 90s, something like that? I, I'm, I'm 50, I'm losing all memories. I'm, I'm working, I'm yeah. help trying yeah. to get you well, there. Well, he literally walked in with the print under his arm to SMU. Yeah, no. There, 16 millimeter print. For years, there was no way to see the film. Zero. It, there, there, at that point, there's a college distribution system, but there's not an indie distribution system. There's a couple of, of beginning attempts but you don't really see anything until the middle of the next decade. But you booked by theater, so there was a, you know you knew the art house in Boston, you knew the art house in Chicago, and there weren't a lot of them. And so you'd call the theater up, and you would a lot of times you'd move it that way, and it got moved through the college circuit where there was an established way to do it. Kent thought this film would go to the New York Film Festival, yeah. and then he found out at that time that the New York Film Festival only took foreign films. <coughs> So he started the USA Film Festival for American Independent Film because there was nowhere to show the film in the USA well, after they had won Mannheim. What was, what was curious is that uh, in Mexico, where all we watched mostly was foreign films <laughs> by, by, by Spielberg, Lucas, Scorsese. Right, right, right. No, no, what what was curious in Mexico? It, it became a legendary film because we couldn't we could not get it. Because you couldn't get it. No, we, no we were distributed. I was part of uh, back then was the cinema clubs. You yeah. know, we we would rent sixteen millimeter copies. We would thread the projector, charge the tickets, analyze the film with the audience. Yes, right. we were both. We, we would do everything, and this this film was legendary, like legendary. Uh, as as a, an artifact that really encapsulated uh, American independent film. And seeing it, this is the first time I see it on the big screen. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I saw it on TV or larger TVs, but it's fascinating how 
incredibly powerful it is, uh, and it yeah. changes. I mean, it really uh, en encapsulates a moment, for sure, but it also, the narrative is so ahead of its time. It's 20, 30 years ahead of its time. And there are a lot of narrative resources and bravery that, that uh, basically have never been explored in the same way, you know? It, it really is experimental, no, non-linear, completely genuine, and, uh, and it's almost an exemplary. Uh, uh, now, independent films sometimes fall into formulas just the way Hollywood films do. And it really is refreshing to see that the origin was straight from the God, you know, again. Harvard had taken, in the 90s, had taken David Holston's diary and created their film studies department around it. And they called it fiction, nonfiction. And out of that came Ross McElway uh -huh. and Sherman's March uh -huh. and Time Indefinite. In this and yet you still could, and and yet you still could not see David Holtzman's diary pretty much anywhere. Well, you could see it on camp. I mean, because '67 is the start of, of when film schools start happening, and what you, you completely lack. This is, was part of the canon. This was shown in all kinds of class. It raised issues of narrative, uh, of documentary. It got to the whole core of what a lot of these film schools did. So this was a core film. I mean, there was a 15-year period where if you went to film school, you probably saw this in two or three classes. But it wasn't theatrical. Kit and Jim were going to write. They were contracted to write a book for the Museum of Modern Art about Cinema Verte. They had taken the idea to the Museum of Modern Art and said, by the way, there's no sort of <coughs> literature about what Cinema Verte is. We think we should write it. <laughs> and they went, okay. So then they got into doing the research to write the book, and Kit started in New York at Drew Associates with Ricky Leacock. Yeah, 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 yeah. And D.A. Penny Baker. And what he started, the first thing he did was transcribe dialogue. And he would listen and write the dialogue. And he always said, that's how I learned how to write the way people talked. Because he spent all this time translating dialogue. So he had this in into the idea of Cinema Verte documentaries. And off they went to do this research, to write this book, because they were going to create this information, and they went, fuck! <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. And so they decided to take that big $2,500 and make a movie. <laughs> and Kit didn't want to act in it. He never thought he was going to be an actor. And so they created what would be David Holtzman's diary. And as I said, Jim went and shot it with another, another actor. La, 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 la. You, you, you know what, what is great right about Kid as an actor, and I recommend everybody just thinking about this one, but watch him on Running on Empty. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah that scene is fantastic. Yeah. He's absolutely He's fantastic. fantastic. Running on Empty? Go yeah. see Running on Empty if you have Yeah. Joaquin yeah. Phoenix is in there. Yeah. His Joaquin brother, Phoenix. River. River. I'd like Rude. to just touch on one thing that I think was one of Kit's great achievements is uh, the USA Film Festival in Dallas for yes. independent film. Because he, because I, I was in high school at the time, we'd skip, skip high school yeah, and go I'm see so it. Well, there you go. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Not that much older. Uh, but, and, uh, but I mean, it was it was a place where I mean, I, it was like Warhol. Uh, Hopper. Uh, yeah, Dennis Hopper. There was a real famous incident there where uh, uh, it was Norman. Was it Norman Mailer? I, or it was? I think it was Norman Mailer during. Is it Moon Maiden? It was uh, Rip Torn who came out. Maidstone. Maidstone who came out drunk and basically told Dallas they killed John Kennedy. <laughs> and I mean, but it was like all these these huge people uh, that came through. It was I think it was the last time. One of the last things that Capra was involved with yeah. was that yours, yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, and uh, but anyway, it's a, and but that, uh, and it was. Uh, uh, Dennis Hopper showed off and peed off somebody's balcony. Yeah, it was. I mean, yeah. but I mean, it was. Be premiered there with Robert Altman. That's right. Yeah. You know, that's right. That's right. But I mean, it was uh, this this uh, and it was a, a great inspiration for uh, Sundance. And uh, that kind of goes unnoticed sometimes that that whole era 
in the would that be the late sixties, early seventies? It was early seventies, early, se early yeah. to middle seventies. Yeah, and, and, it, and it, Kit was good friends with. It was G. With William Bob, Ch yeah, with Redford. With Redford, yeah. So it all sort of. And they kind of gave him a. I think they gave him a, just a kind of a free hand to do. Uh, whatever they were doing, because it seemed to be pretty successful. What, USA? Yeah. Up to a point. Yeah, up to a point. Anyway, it was, it was a wonderful thing. I, I think just to, kind of, just to sort of wrap up that question, how did people see it? By and large, they didn't see it. Yes. Okay. And then, but that's, the that's, that's, that's one of the many great reasons why Kit Carson's being inducted to the Texas Film Hall of Fame. He went out, found a way, so that people could see these kinds of films, created these incredible ripples that are rippling right through the city over the next week and many other cities that do film festivals and this is a big thing that get made happen in addition to all these other tiny things that blossom from these great careers <laughs> just a tiny bit of i've never been called tiny original texas film commissioners when the texas film commission first started they really didn't do much besides actually give grants to filmmakers and one of the first filmmakers he gave a grant to was Eagle Cornell. Mm -hmm. I think that, that he was like he, he was a little bit like Zeely. Kind of. Yeah, yeah, you know, he was never center stage, taking all the spotlight. But he, but if you go through the Zapruder film, or you go through the <laughs> In the Burning, or you go through a crowd shot in Manhattan, you see him in a corner <laughs> doing something important over there. Yeah. <laughs> Let's, let, let's take one more question. Uh, bathing in these great feelings. Let's take one more great question from the eyes. Right back here. I had a question about the characters that populated this movie, and I was curious if, if they were friends of Kit, and specifically the mural dude. What's his story? Ah, uh, the mural <laughs> dude, Lorenzo. Um, Lorenzo, everyone was in their own way cast. Um, they were either friends of Kit's or friends of Jim McBride's. Uh, Thelma Shoemaker, who went on to become Marty Scorsese's editor for just about everything, um, was their editor. And they got to a point and realized that they were missing something. And that the film didn't quite add up, even the second time. So they came up with the idea of Lorenzo, and they shot that after... That was a second shoot after their original... Um, shoot to put that information in, which was, this is bullshit. There is no truth on film. <laughs> and so they got Lorenzo, and they cast him, as they cast Penny, as they cast pretty much everyone besides the uh, Thunderbird woman who did actually just show up, who was not a woman. Nope. I feel like I'm the only one who did not know she that. <laughs> I did not know that for a while. Uh, when I saw it, but she was not a woman. <laughs> and as I said, Mike Wadley. You didn't see the mustache in this. No, I did not. I was looking at 16 millimeter on uh, VHS. And, Mike uh, Wadley shot um, Woodstock and the much underrated Wolfen. Yeah, <laughs> and if you listen closely, you can actually hear it's it's Wadley's voice. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't dub Kit's voice over it. And the, the shot, the shot coming out of the subway is just amazing. Yes. Yeah. Well, so brain. much of it's yeah, amazing. No steady cams. No GoPros, steady cams. That the Eclair was an amazing machine. It really liberated yeah. filmmakers uh, in the sixties and seventies. Amazing piece of equipment. Either Kit shot it yeah. when you're when you're sure, like over his head. Yeah. Or Michael Wadley shot it, and it was, it was before it's time, and truly, people got so upset when they found out that it was <laughs> fake yeah. that they booed it. On the other hand, the Museum of Modern Art made them pay back, by the way, the <laughs> advance, the $2,500, which luckily they got from Mannheim as for winning the grand prize. <laughs> I, I, th I think that at the end of the day, what, what is great and can be said is that uh, you would learn so much more about Cinema Verite by the movie than the fucking book that they never wrote. Exactly. <laughs> you know? so, exactly. Job well done, goddammit. Yeah.